Is Pokemon Legends Arceus a better game than Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl? Yes. Does Legends Arceus have a lot of creativity and thought put into it? Yep. Is Legends Arceus a breath of fresh air the Pokemon series desperately needed? Mm-hmm. Did Game Freak try something new and put in effort? Affirmative. So, is Legends Arceus a good game? No. <laughs> What? Kidum Red. Hello, fellow Jerry Cans. I think Pokemon Legends Arceus is very similar to the game's Pokemon X and Y, glorified tech demos that are hollow and incomplete. Games that blew everyone's mind when they came out because of how new and revolutionary they were, and after years passed and later games came out, forgotten. The only difference is Pokemon X and Y had 3D graphics, and Legends Arceus had the Pokemon catching mechanic. The game has been getting great reviews by fans and critics alike, which is actually a first in the damn series in a long time. But, I'm sorry, Pokemon Lens Arceus is another shallow experience for me. Oh I know, I'm just a guy that hates all modern Pokemon games and milk videos based on it, despite the fact that I praised the Let's Go games and made an hour fucking long video praising the hell out of Oras that you all seem to have missed, but what do you expect me to do? Lie and be dishonest that I did enjoy Pokemon Lens Arceus? Because, I didn't! Hot take review coming up, let me explain why Legends Arceus tries to be so big, and kinda fails. This is a straight up review of Pokemon Legends Arceus. Oh, and not Arceus, I'm gonna call it Arceus because Arceus sounds so fucking bad. Part 1. What makes a Pokemon game? Many of you might be still baffled why I'm not in love with this game, and let me explain. It's because this game is missing too much stuff. It feels like they solely focus on the Pokemon catching mechanic in the wild, and everything else was sidelined. So I'll ask you this question. What makes a Pokemon game? In my opinion, the reason why the Pokemon series have been so successful despite uneven quality over the years, why it appeals to so many people, and why it sells so well, is because Pokemon games have many different aspects of the game that can appeal to various tastes and people. Collection enthusiasts can enjoy collecting Pokemon and completing the Pokedex, RPG battle nerds can enjoy the competitive battle side of Pokemon, people like me that just likes adventure and exploring in video games can enjoy new regions with culture, People just like cute Pokemon can enjoy the casual side of the games like Contest or Pokemon Amy, and the list goes on. Pokemon games are a mix of turn-based RPG, semi-open world exploration, Zelda-style dungeon puzzle solving, catching critters and raising them, and more. Like it or not, the Pokemon series is meant for everyone and has something for everyone, and that's why it's so successful. And Legends Arceus feels like it only focused on one aspect of the Pokemon games and that's the Pokemon catching part. Everything else in the game that's not related to catching Pokemon feels neglected or half-assed, or worse, rushed and cutting corners. And that is why I really can't call this a good game or I enjoyed it. When I'm out in the open areas and just catching Pokemon randomly, the game starts to get fun. But the moment I return to that stupid dead village, which I'll talk about in detail later, where I see lazy animated cutscenes with boring dialogue that goes nowhere, or I find that there are barely trainer battles in the game, or I discover nothing in the open areas, no dungeons, treasure, settlements except wild Pokemon, that's when the game loses me. It just feels like Game Freak was experimenting with the new catching mechanic, wanted to copy the success and feel of Breath of the Wild, and after designing the catching mechanic, rushed through everything else and called it a day. That's why I compared this game to Pokemon X and Y, because that game was very similar, except the 3D graphics were the main focus. I commend the game for trying to do something new. It's not something Game Freak has done before and they are trying to get away from their comfort zone. But there are things in the game that aren't just acceptable for a $60 AAA game that's trying to be like Breath of the Wild, which I'll discuss further in the video. Legends Arceus is a game that needed more time of development to iron everything out and complete everything. But at last, the game had to come out after only two years after the release of the last major release, because of money, and we got another incomplete game yet again. 
I don't think I would have been this unhappy if the game at least had many trainers to fight or something similar to the gym system or island trials. Couldn't you sprinkle random NPCs in the overworld that just battles you like any other Pokemon game? The Clan Warden seems to be what the gym leaders are supposed to be. They even share the same theme. But their battles are hardly a challenge and they just randomly battle you for story reasons. No gym leader progression, not many fun NPCs to battle, it all feels so missing in this game. Instead, the main progression mark ranking in the game is again, based on your catching and collection of Pokemon. Because the whole game is completely based around that. If you're fine with this fact, the fact that the game solely focused on catching and not much in battling trainers, exploration, and everything else in Pokemon. If you could have fun solely by just going around catching Pokemon the while randomly for hours on end without getting bored. If you're one of those people that does find satisfaction in capturing monsters and grinding for shiny Pokemon without losing patience, you will enjoy this game. I think that's why I've seen so many people say, this is the Pokemon game I've dreamed for years in reviews and comments. I understand most of these people aren't being stupid or have bad taste, they just really enjoy the catching. Many people dreamt of catching critters in real time, and we finally got that. However, that is not enough for me. The game needs more. I want more. And everything else is shallow and feels incomplete. But before I complain about the game, I can't brush off the good side and all the effort that went into the catching Pokemon in the world, so let's talk about that. Part 2 The Catching Mechanic like I said, every ounce of effort went into this part of the game, and it really shows. I admit, the game gets pretty fun when you're just fucking around the world and trying to catch Pokemon. I appreciate that there is a lot of improvement from Sword and Shield's dead, empty wild areas. The Pokemon in the wild feels like actual animals, not fucking 3D models T-posing around like zombies. I like how some Pokemon act shy and run away when you approach them, some Pokemon like Apom act friendly when you get near them, some Pokemon are an asshole and attacks you like a bitch. Considering this was Game Freak's first attempt at a real-time action, I was really worried about the controls. However, I was glad to find that the movement of the character is actually pretty fluent, and the aiming Pokeball feels natural, and you can even turn on gyro controls which is helpful. Also, throwing the balls to hit Pokemon from the behind, and landing a critical hit is very satisfying when you manage to pull it off. The most fun I had was with the Alpha Pokemon. Basically, these red-eyed boss Pokemon romp around in certain areas, and they're super aggressive and powerful. At first, they all seemed overleveled and had low catch rates, so I thought they sucked and were not worth the effort. However, when I figured out that you need to be stealthy and use their fucking brain and skills, it became fun for me. Using berries as bait to distract the alpha Pokemon so they move to certain positions, throwing smoke grenades like motherfucking player knows battlegrounds and other items to get close to Pokemon without getting caught, crouching and sneaking behind their back to throw the ball as close as possible at their asses, it gets actually really tense and also fun. And when you manage to hit them from the behind to land a critical catch, and finally manage to catch an alpha, it's really satisfying when you succeed. And kudos to you Game Freak, this is actual good game design. High risk, high return that requires skills. Many options for the player to approach the challenge from doing it in real time or traditional battles feels natural. Great job! I also appreciate that there are a lot of challenges to unlock in the Pokedex. Back in the old days when you caught a single Pokemon, you were done. But here, there are many achievements and goals like feeding certain amount of Pokemon, or seeing a Pokemon use a certain move, so there's more thought put into the process of catching Pokemon and collection. There's also the space-time distortions that form on the map. I do like it when the game doesn't treat you like a baby and offers you a chance to fight super hard battles optionally, and this is one of those cases. Basically, a bunch of strong and rare Pokemon spawn in certain concentrated areas randomly, and it's a nice addition that adds some RNG and motive to go out somewhere. Surviving in it is just challenging enough. One thing I mixed about is frenzied Pokemon though. You see, when a Pokemon gets frenzied, they don't go in balls anymore. You basically have two options, dodge attacks and throw mall balls at them so they get dazed, or pull out your Pokemon and battle them the traditional way with turn-based combat. I don't know, the second method is a bit jarring for me. The entire game is in real time and tense, but the moment you throw out your Pokemon, it goes into turn-based combat, so all the tension is lost. It can use infinite amount of time to choose moves. It's jarring going from real time to turn-based is what I'm saying. So the first option of throwing mud balls or rotten apricorns at them is more fun for me. But the game makes it really difficult to gather these items and quite rare, so most of the time when a Pokemon is frenzied, you have no option but to battle them in turn-based combat, which I don't like. Later, I figured out that when a Pokemon gets frenzied, if you just run the fuck away from their side on Stantler and come back, they get calm again, which is helpful. Still, feels like a hassle for the player, and not really natural game design for me. Still, this is a complete new game mode for the Pokemon series. It is indeed refreshing, 
and you start to have fun when you're just going around catching Pokemon. But when you decide to do something else in the game other than catching Pokemon, it starts to go downhill. Very steeply, I might add. Starting with... Part 3. Breath of the Exploration Spoilers, I'm going to make a lot of comparisons to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. If you honestly think this game isn't trying to rip off or be influenced by Breath of the Wild, you're blind or stupid. And watch this montage. <laughs> And yes, taking influence and copying other games is not a bad thing. Hell, you could even argue Breath of the Wild copied Ubisoft's open world towers. But if you take a lot of influence from a successful game's format, you can't help but compare it to the original source material and how it lacks stuff compared to it. Anyways, the main feature that I was disappointed with the game is the empty, boring open world that Pokemon roam around in. Everything is empty and barren, everything you find feels so randomly generated, there doesn't seem to be much thought put into the map design. Let's compare it to Breath of the Wild. What I love about the game's Hyrule is that every single part of the map has a purpose and something to do. Exploring big open environments is fun in this game. It's not just because there are many biomes. In some parts of the map, you'll find hard bosses like Lionels or Taluses. In some areas, you'll find ruins or abandoned towns that store valuable items in treasure chests. You'll find NPCs with minigames to play with. And of course, you can also find shrines with puzzles spread all across the map. There are caves and waterfalls hiding secrets. And lastly, there are the Korok Seeds, minor puzzles you can ignore. It's kind of fun and cute when you find them. Just don't try to fight all 900 of them though. Point is, every special looking ruins, or town, or tree, or summit of mountains, has a purpose and something to discover in Breath of the Wild. Contrast that to Legends Arceus. In this game, other than the Pokemon, there is no reason to explore the map. There are treasures and items you find on the map, sure, like ore veins, but everything feels randomly generated and spawned there with an algorithm, not laid there on purpose. I could tell this game doesn't have good rewards for exploration and world design when I was in the ocean area. There is a shipwreck in the game. If this was like Breath of the Wild, you would have discovered a hidden treasure near your ship that holds a quest item or a super strong sword, a story or side quest related to a ghost about the shipwreck, I don't know. But there's nothing in Lens Arceus. The shipwreck is just there. It's there for decoration. Same with these random ruins you find on the map. You find various Greek or Roman looking architecture ruins spread across the map. Jarring because this region is based off old Hokkaido, but whatever. And they're all just for decoration that serve no purpose. Actually, almost every object in the overworld has no purpose. Oh, you found a secret cave under the cliff? Well, the reward is you get to look at a cave painting that's also in other parts of the map. In Breath of the Wild, these ruins would have had a flashback cussing with Zelda, lore easter egg, a shrine quest, a hidden item or something, but there's nothing. Nothing! Nothing! You know there's a problem with the game, when your game literally has a flying and glide feature and a motherfucking volcano, but you can't jump into the volcano's summit. That's like the first instinct of a gamer when they see a volcano, jump into it to see what's inside. But in this game, nope, surrounded by invisible walls. You can't jump into the volcano cause fuck you. And before you mention it, I know there are those spirit tomb wisps and the unknown scattered on the map, but they all seem randomly placed, it doesn't feel satisfying when you find one, it does feel like a fucking grindy fetch quest to get Spirit Tomb and Unknown on the Pokedex. There's zero puzzle aspect to it, or brain thinking required. Now, you may say it's unfair to compare this to a Zelda game, because Game Freak is an incompetent indie developer company unlike Nintendo or Monolith Soft. Fine, let's compare Legends Arceus to the past good Pokemon games for the sake of being fair then. I like how in the past games, despite being set in a modern setting, Pokemon featured a lot of dungeons and puzzles you need to solve to progress. Like, take the Huon region for example. There are about 15 dungeons, that being caves like Granite Cave or forests like Petalburg Woods, plus 8 gyms with their own unique puzzles, leading to about 23 areas to explore and solve. In Lens Arceus, 
I literally had to go through one puzzle that required brain power, and that was Snow Point Temple. Everything else was chicken feed. Everything else is just barren, empty fields. No mazes, no strength rock puzzles, nothing. I guess the real puzzle is figuring out why people blindly praise this game. <laughs> In the original Gen 4 game, Solacia Ruins was a confusing cave hellhole that required you to read unknown letters and memorize directions. In Lennus Arceus, Solacia Ruins is a boring empty rectangle room that probably took an hour to design. In the original Gen 4 games, Spirit Pillar was on top of Mount Coronet, a confusing huge maze dungeon that required many items and patience to get through. In Legends Arceus, the path to the Spirit Pillar is a straight, empty, linear hallway. Just like the previous straight, empty, linear hallway, the previous straight, empty, linear hallway, and the previous straight, empty, linear hallway. In the previous Pokemon games, except for special cases, most legendary Pokemon were at the farthest point inside dungeons. Heatran was at the end of a confusing volcano dungeon called Stark Mountain. Giratina was at the end of a confusing misty dungeon maze called Turnback Cave. In Legends Arceus, both of these Pokemon can be found instantly in empty square rooms with no puzzle solving to get there. Do I smell... cutting corners? Uh, yeah. The only special discovery I found by exploring with satisfaction was literally one thing, and that was the discovery of the three Sinnoh starters. They are in small, very remote parts of the map that's off the beaten path, and you would have never discovered them unless you took the time to explore the map. I want more of this, this kind of exploration and reward. But instead, everything was randomly generated. There's no point in exploring the map, except again, catching new Pokemon. And some of you might say, oh, this game's not about exploring. It's about catching Pokemon. Map design is not important. To that I say, why can't we have both? Why can't we have both the Mew Pokemon roaming and catching, and the traditional style of Pokemon exploration and puzzle solving? Why only be satisfied with one, when they could just put in more time and effort to satisfy both criteria that make up a Pokemon game? Another thing to discover that's missing in this game are villages. In Breath of the Wild, despite being set in a post-apocalyptic Hyrule, there are plenty of towns with unique NPCs and tents to discover and interact with, or past Pokemon games. they are like a shit ton of towns and cities to discover. In this game, the only town is Jube Life Village, which acts as the hub. There are two other settlements in the game, the Camps of the Diamond and Pearl Clans, but they're also small and serve no purpose to the game, except one side quest with a gender bet Masuda that talks about Psyducks for some reason. Is that your kink, Masuda? Um, anyways, Jube Life Village is the only town, and I really need to talk extensively about this disaster of a game design in detail. Part 4 Jube Dead Village Okay, the moment I got to this town, I knew something was up. Something was not quite right about it. It's like when Harry Mason stepped into the sleepy town of Silent Hill for the first time. Your gut tells you something is terribly wrong. What you know, you know you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire playthrough. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Like a splinter in your mind. Driving you mad. Well, actually, it's simple. And it's the fact that not a single NPC moves in this town. Everyone just stands still, frozen, as if they're T-posing or have missing animation cycles. It's super distracting, it makes the town feel like a dead zombie town. Actually, scratch that. Even zombies move. This is the town of Weeping Angels. I've complained about this fact in my first impressions video, and I've actually seen people defending this? Which is just facepalming. That's again compared to Breath of the Wild. In Hateno Village, for example, NPCs move around and have individual paths assigned to them. There are merchants with horses moving around the village, there are women that gossip at the town center, there are children that run and play around like actual children in real life. In Len Zarcius, playful children just stand around doing nothing. In Juve Life Village, there is an NPC that's carrying water pails or something, but he never actually delivers water. He's just stuck on that bridge from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. The shopkeepers at the market just stand around like statues in front of their stores, and they barely react to you when you approach them. Want to see how a real market in a fucking video game is supposed to be like? <laughs> I want detail with NPCs in games. Details are what makes a good game excellent. There are details in Breath of the Wild with the NPCs, such as Paya reacting to a naked fanboy Link in panties and being shy about it in Kakariko Village. 
Hence why Zelda is an excellent game series. So the village NPCs don't move, literally except for two people. One guy who has the animation of cutting a tree forever, and one lady who's moving her broomstick. Like, it's 6 frames per second here. Also, not a single NPC walks in the entire game out of cutscenes, even in the wild. You know how in Breath of the Wild there are people walking on roads? Like I said, couldn't you sprinkle in other humans or trainers in the world that walks around the environment? Putting random travelers that are willing to battle the player feels like the most logical thing to put in a video game other than wild Pokemon, but nope. In fact, the only time NPCs walk is in cutscenes, and they couldn't animate NPCs walking from a distance to get close to you, everyone just randomly pops out of the blue during story moments even though they were clearly not there. Or they use the classic black screen thing from Gen 7 and 8 to cut corners with animation. Again, maybe it's unfair to compare an indie game to Zelda, so let's compare it to their previous Pokemon games. Places in past Pokemon games were always lively, with many NPCs that move. Remember the many NPCs walking around the two ponds by the daycare at Rune 117 in Pokemon Emerald? I actually had to go back to Sword and Shield footage because I was actually suspicious this was something dropped in Gen 7 or 8 and I never noticed it until now, but NPCs do move in Sword and Shield and the Alola games. So what the hell happened here? If you're gonna try to make a semi-open world game that is reminiscent of Breath of the Wild, things like this are not acceptable in a $60 game. It's super distracting when the Pokemon are animated very fluently like real animals, and the humans are frozen statues. If the game was not trying to be so big and grandeur like Zelda, and trying to be like a traditional 2D Pokemon game, maybe cutting corners like this would have been more acceptable, but it's not. Like I said, they really must have put in all their efforts in the wild Pokemon, and everything else was half-assed. Part 5. Story and Ultra Cutscenes PTSD Let's also talk about the story, cause it's another train wreck. At first, I really liked the setting of the game. I always thought a Pokemon game not set in a modern contemporary setting would be interesting, and it's basically that. Also, BDSP basically did jack shit to expand Sinnoh's lore and story, so actually seeing new forms of Dialga and Palkia and Spear Pillar before it blew up was interesting. Similar to almost everything else in the game, conceptually, there's a lot of nice stuff. I like how the game clearly establishes that the Pokemon are kinda dangerous creatures, and they can basically maim or murder you in an instant if they wanted to. It's pretty unique to see Pokemon creatures in a new light, and seeing an Alpha Chansey try to murder you is pretty funny. I also like seeing the ancestors of classic Pokemon characters. Some say this is dumb fan service, but I like the fact that almost every single ancestor has completely different personalities despite them looking alike. Probably my favorite was Lady Cyrus being a nice old Tsundere woman, Saturn and Candace being thief girls, and Mars being a peppy barber and overall the best character in the game that I would happily sim for. And that's where my compliments end for the game's story. Cause this game's story is just boring and just as. The first major problem of the main campaign's plot is All talk and no action. It's just endless, boring cutscenes with boring dialogue animated lazily that goes on for eternity, and almost everything is just told, not shown. Talk, 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 no show. Here are some examples. There's the Diamond and Pearl Clan in Hisui. Apparently, they are rival warring factions with tense relations. Well, too bad, we never got to see a bunch of them interact with each other or be at each other's throats. We just get boring dialogue about how much history they have, and how boring Irida and Adaman's lives are. A cutscene with flashbacks, ancient cave painting art, or something that expands the lore please? They really should have copied Impa in Breath of the Wild, aka the exposition machine. Also, the Holy Noah Pokemon are getting frenzied for some reason, and the player must defeat them in battle to save the surrounding area. You know in Breath of the Wild, we actually saw how the corrupted Divine Beasts and Calamity Ganon were messing up Pyro and its areas, and why we needed to defeat them. Save the Zora Village from getting drowned by Varuta. Save the Gerudo tribe getting zapped by the thunderstorms of Va Naboris. Save Hyrule Castle by defeating Calamity Ganon that's corrupting it. And Legends Arceus, why are we even fighting these yellow highlighters again? Do we ever see them attacking villagers, being a threat to its around the environment or some shit? No, of course not. That requires animating cinematics and that's too much work. 
Uh, remember that embarrassing moment in Sword and Shield where they couldn't animate Gigantamax Pokemon because in Chaos, and the game just tells you it happened? Legends Arceus is just that, but the whole game. Speaking of animation, like I said, this game's cutscenes are about as bad as Gen 7 and 8 games. You really feel that this game was directed by the guy who made Pokemon Ultra Cunt and Ultra Arse through the cutscenes. Even though this game is completely open and not tile based, every character still moves and spins as if they're stuck in a tile like environment. I swear almost every single cutscene or fetch quest have the classic blast screen moment traditional to modern Pokemon games, where the screen goes dark whenever something that's hard to animate happens on screen. It was distracting in the Gen 7 games, it was more distracting in HD Sword and Shield. So guess how it's distracting in Breath of the Wild Copycat? You can't keep making $60 games like this on a console, with other games that have 1000 times more effort put into it for the same price. Even though I can't confirm this because I'm not a tech whiz hacker guy, but I bet you they made this game on the same engine as the Galar games, which means they're still using the same engine that started in Pokemon X and Y 9 years ago. Please stop doing this. Also, you could tell how much they were cutting corners when they keep reusing the same scenes. Do they think we would find it endearing when we keep coming back to that stupid restaurant so we can eat potato mochis in the black screen for the 800th time? Couldn't they like, have one cutscene with a player and Akari farm in the village, or one cutscene of them hanging out at the battle arena, or one cutscene of them taking care of Pokemon at the farm, or one cutscene of them helping people build buildings? But no, every time you beat a boss, copy-paste the scene with potato mochi but just with slightly different dialogue. It just smells of again, lazy, rushed, and cutting corners. Speaking of Akari, at the beginning of the game, they make a great deal of, about your rival. She's your senpai and wants you to get used to Hisui. She has a Pikachu, but she has trouble getting friendly with it, and she needs to get to know her Pikachu. They set up this arc, and she just disappears from the main campaign after the halfway point. Did their writers forget to make more scenes for her and ran out of time? The game has stupid moments that goes nowhere that just feels like it's there to lengthen out the runtime when it's completely unnecessary. The game forces you to go back to that Juve Life Galaxy building for no reason more times than the Pokemon Company's office deserves getting nuked for making BDSP and USUM. Like, why are we constantly forced to go up to that Rowan Ancestor's room and every cutscene looks the same? It's as if they were too lazy or ran out of time to make other towns and buildings so every important story moment has to take place at the same place to conserve resources. But that's impossible and far-fetched, right? <laughs> but the base offense is at the end of the game. The final three hours of the game is the most boring part of the game where you participate in the challenge of pressing the A button to proceed while trying not to fall asleep at the boring dialogue. But we finally get to Spirit Pillar. We finally are getting some HT cutscenes involving the creation trio and mute lore with legendaries that we missed out in the shitty remakes. The game gets pretty climactic. We catch Diaga or Palkia first, depending on what you did in the story. Then OMG, Palkia or Diaga appears and it's time for an epic legendary showdown between the legendary duo. But then, the characters only decide to run away for some reason. And we spend the next 30 minutes with boring cutscenes of characters constantly saying, We should do something! Should we do something? We should do something! Should we do something? We should do something! Should we do something? We should do something! Then go to a cave and fight some bandits for some reason, and then go back to Spirit Pillar for the final showdown. What kind of cop-out was that during the climax? That was completely unnecessary. And that's what Masuda said to Omori at night. <laughs> oh, and the game has no clear antagonist or threat. You just keep moving on to the next area to collect Pokemon and that's it. And maybe soothe some yellow highlighters on the way. Maybe another explanation of why the game's story is so fucking boring. There's no mystery, threat, or reveals. So because of that... Oh, and spoilers if you care about this shit. The game decides to do a twist the villain in the post-game because that's a mute constant in the Pokemon series never done before. And gasp! The Cynthia ancestor is actually behind everything! Yup, this guy barely did anything throughout the whole campaign, but suddenly it's another not showing but telling moment where he suddenly hates God, I mean Arceus, and is in league with Satan, I mean Giratina. He battles you to gather all the plates to do something. Oh, and he starts talking like Cyrus about creating a new world because poetry, so if they rhyme. Why do you suddenly hate God when the post game starts without zero build up in the main campaign? Ugh, this guy might be worse than Rose from Sword and Shield. That was his mistake. Part 6 Far Fetched Quests. But hey, even if the story's ass, the game might compensate for that with interesting side quests or things to do other than the main campaign, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. This game tries to be like other popular open world games with cramming a lot of side quests, and boy, this is a fail because most of them are pointless or stupid. Basically, 98% of the side quests in the game are bring me a certain Pokemon. 
Bring me a Wurmple. Bring me a Floatzel. Bring me a Magikarp. Now, to their credit, at least they sometimes mix it up as complete a certain Pokedex entry or bring me a Pokemon that looks like something, but still bring me a certain Pokemon at the end. They're all fetch quests. Now, having fetch quests is not a bad thing, but that's when the fetch quests are not the majority like in this game. Also, there's really no reward. They just give you random items you can find easily as a reward. The only motivation for completing the side quests are for the psychotic completionist nerds that reside in this fandom. Let's compare it to Breath of the Wild again. Review Legends RC without mentioning Breath of the Wild challenge, difficulty impossible. In Breath of the Wild, there were stupid side quests, sure, like the damn kid at Hateno Village who requires you to bring certain weapons every now and then, but there are more side quests than that. For example, solve the mystery of the three trees next to the mountains at Hateno Village. There are mysterious trees far away from the village that you can see, and solve the mystery by exploring the surrounding areas. Or the side quest where you protect the water loft message bottle from getting destroyed or getting stuck in a river. Or taking a photo of a Lionel and bring it to an NPC. See how diverse these side quests are? In Lens Arceus, the only side quests that I found that were interesting were two things. First, there are three minigames where you've just hit balloons in a certain time, a time trial. Pop the balloons and finish the course before the time runs out. We needed more side quests like this. Quests that aren't just a fetch quest for a Pokemon. A side quest that is fun and involves skills. The second side quest that I found probably sums up everything that's wrong with the game nicely. A quest giver tells us to do research about a lost village that his ancestors lived in, and do it by looking for lost journals scattered across the snow area. The journal details about Frostlass, one of my favorite Gen 4 Pokemon. On paper, it's a great side quest that involves mystery, and can expand the lore of the Hisui region and the Pokemon Frostlass. But the actual quest is, you just randomly find a journal on the ground, and again, battle Frostlass, and you're done. Where is the lost village? This is just an empty lot. Mr. Questgiver, you talked about a damn village. I was finally hoping we'd get another village other than the Diamond and Pearl clan tents, but nope. The side quest is literally called Traces of a Lost Village. Where are the traces or the village? Why are they fucking lying with the title? Where is it? Where the hell is it? Look at me. Where the hell is it? Look at me. Stay with me. Seven. Oh, is it because that would have required modeling a 3D render of a village or abandoned ruins of a village? And that's too much work because this is a game about wild Pokemon? Ugh, everything except the wild Pokemon is so lazy, just like the rest of this stupid franchise! Part 7 Minor Things Minor compliments, complaints, and thoughts before I wrap up. The Mew Hisui informs are cool. Ever since Generation 7, I always thought regional variants were the best things added to the franchise. I always liked the Alolo and Galarian forms. Expanding on classic designs is always fun. Heck, that's one of my favorite things for Moras. The Mew Mega Evolution for the Hoenn Pokemon. So I was wishing to see the Mew Sinuan forms for Pokemon the Sinnoh Remix, and was pissed we didn't get any in BDSP. Thankfully, this game ended up with the Hisuian forms, and I know some people don't like the designs, but I really like them. Seeing a Mew Evolution line for the Sneasel family is cool and dank Typhlosion high on weed is hilarious. I just wish we can bring these new forms over to more traditional style Pokemon games, but whoopsie, no national deck support cause decks it, waha. Let's also talk about the noble Pokemon. Basically, these guys are the Blight Ganon fight ripoffs, in a sense that they're the story's main bosses, they all look the same, and they're all kind of forgettable. I don't know, Pokemon trying real-time action Dark Souls style boss battle is refreshing, but these battles are too basic. It feels like it needs more than a dodge and throw button. I feel like bosses in Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time are more complicated than this. Also, the game lets you throw out your Pokemon for a traditional battle, but again, very jarring when it goes from real time to turn based suddenly. Furthermore, you don't need to do it to beat the boss. You can just beat it with the pellets, so why bother? There's also the agile and strong style during battles. Disclaimer, I'm not a big RPG nerd. I barely played other JRPGs, so I don't have much to say about it, and I don't think I should be the one to judge if it was a good system they implemented. Hell, I'm still not sure how it's supposed to work? Why does the other opponent get to attack two times, or they attack immediately when the battle starts? What I will say about the strong and agile style is that this new system existing in the game proves my theory that Legends Arceus is just an experimental venture by Game Freak, not really a complete game. Like, think about it. This Agile Strong system doesn't really have to do anything with the wild Pokemon catching mechanic in real time. They could have implemented this system in Sword and Shield if they wanted to. It does feel like they're saying, since we're trying new things in the game, let's try changing up the battle formula too. They're just throwing everything new on the board and seeing what sticks. Well, I guess they will keep the system or improve it or delete it based on fan reaction. I don't know, Battle Nerds. Go say something about it. Well, that's about it for now. Is there more to say about this game? 
I don't feel like I'm missing anything important. Hmm. Oh, and the graphics of this game sucks. That's the one criticism with the game everyone agrees on, and you must have expected me to rant about it for 15 minutes. But I didn't, because I chose not to. Also, in my opinion, you don't need good graphics for a good game. Anyone can make an excellent game with bad graphics, but they didn't. So in conclusion, Pokemon Legends Arceus is a game that tries to be fresh and new, succeeds in some departments, but fails in many other parts as well. The core catching and battling wild Pokemon interaction is fun, but the world has nothing to find and explore, the hub town is a dead mess without any enjoyment, the story is really bad, and the cutscenes are so lazy, the side quests are all bad or lazy, and overall, it's another incomplete game. Because the overall catching mechanic is done well, the game gets fun when you're just randomly trying to catch Pokemon, but the moment you try something else in the game, you see everything else is barren, empty, rushed, or lazy. And if you only care about the catching, you will enjoy this game. Me, however, needed more. The Pokemon series have been suffering from a constant repeat of pumping out the same game annually with the same formula with more and more degrading quality, so at least they finally are trying to turn things around. I think the reason why the fans and critics hail this game as the greatest thing ever is because the series have gotten so bad, basic competence and the fact that they try something new is shocking and looks good. Yes, this game is a step in the right direction for the Pokemon franchise, but one step in the right direction is not enough when we're stuck in the middle of a swamp of 151 km radius. At the beginning of the video, I said the game was like Pokemon X and Y. So what now? Pokemon X and Y was seeded by Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, a game that fixed a lot of problems of X and Y in my opinion, and I really liked that game. So my hope is, Game Freak makes a sequel to this game that fixes the problems. This game is not a complete dumpster fire like BDSP where it was dead on arrival just based on concept alone. I see a lot of potential for improving the core concept and fixing the problems. So if the next game is Legends Kurim, Legends Mew or Legends or whatever, I want a Legends style game that makes the world less barren and more fun to explore with things to discover, some actual fucking dungeons and puzzles, more human characters to battle, less shitty story and handholding, and more diverse quests other than fetch quests. Oh, and improved graphics and cutscenes. If they actually do try, if Pokemon Company and Game Freak actually put in time and effort, I think they can succeed at making a great game. So what I'm saying is, Pokemon Lens Arceus alone is not a good game, but it could be a beta test for a better game to come that we pay $60 for because we're idiots. But still, Honestly, after Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl and this game, I would still have preferred a traditional Pokemon remake. Instead of the dumpster fire BDSP that didn't add anything in this, I would have honestly preferred a game in the vein of Pokemon Heart Gold or Oras, a proper Sinnoh remake that keeps the fundamentals the same, but added new lore and features. Not two games that I don't like, one being a heartless, cynical copycat D Master, and one being an empty, experimental, incomplete Breath of the Wild ripoff. Oh, and whenever I say this game is not good, a lot of people accuse me that I don't like innovation, that I like cookie cutter games or some shit. Uh, excuse me, hello? It's not that I hate innovation, it's that I like good, complete games, not empty, barren, experimental, incomplete messes. Game Freak is an incompetent indie company. They honestly overreach with this game, and it really shows with all of the game's fails. Yeah, I'll take a good cookie cutter game that didn't add anything much new, like Black and White 2, over a failed science experiment any day.